Welcome to Mars. Welcome back to Mars Radio. I'm here with our returning guest, Mr. Picasso. What's Welcome good, back. Man? What's happening? So I like this format that we got here of you coming back and visiting with us and speaking with us. I think this is working well, and the, the fans seem to respond to it. How, how are things going on your end? Man, I'm I'm good with it, and it's always uh, it's always a good thing to be in the lab where I'm building. All right, here we go. Let's jump right into it. First topic, LeBron James breaking the scoring title. <laughs> Do you think that it warrants the discussion of GOAT talk? Uh, greatest of all time, no. Uh, scoring champion and you know all time, you know all time great, yes. But you know, I think of it like you know Kareem didn't shoot threes. So one would say LeBron's a better player than he he does. Well, you know the game evolved, and the game of the NBA game evolved from just a lot of two point buckets to three point buckets, which gave him a. Uh, a, a time and a stat sheet of doing it in a lesser time. I think 150 games less than what Kareem did because he only shot twos. But, I mean, it's a great achievement, and I'm glad he did it as a Laker. So do you subscribe to the thought process of first means better? Yeah. Because so you're saying s- because Kareem did it back then with no threes, so what he did was more impressive than what LeBron did with threes kind of cheating? No, what I was saying is that, you know, the game evolved. So LeBron was able to do it in a shorter time than Kareem because mm-hmm. they do shoot threes now. Um, I think that Kareem had a harder road to get in that first spot versus LeBron being able to, you know, in today's game, uh, shoot threes and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, get a lot of, you know. How, how about the level of competition that LeBron's doing it against? Because back then, like, everybody wasn't as good as they are now. So if there was, for every one good player back then, there was 10 average players. Now, for every good player, there's another good player. Right. <laughs> uh, um, I, think, I think the game of basketball back then was tougher versus oh how it is God. now because of the way it's refereed. Um, no, no, that was the Jordan era. We're not talking about Jordan. We're talking about Kareem. Yeah. When Kareem played, he played against white guys that worked at Radio Shack. Well, they, well, they, uh, 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 a fisticuff, <laughs> as they used to call it back in Kareem days, was just a regular foul. I mean, you can get into an actual. But he was doing that against a white guy that worked at Radio Shack. That's not his fault. LeBron's playing against an athlete that's been playing ball his whole life. You, you understand what I'm saying? Like, yeah, the rules are different, but the competition is way more impressive nowadays like people grow up as prodigies basketball prodigies well no well you looking at it as competition in the gym i'm looking at it as competition in life kareem had to endure more than just playing basketball he had to go into racist settings also and be called a nigger at times and playing basketball so it wasn't just all glitz and glamour for kareem it was basically his man his mental played in a role also being a muslim man playing in the nba which it wasn't you know look Looked upon yeah, but even the guys that were saying time. that were white guys that worked at Radio Shack. He could beat them up just as much as he could beat them in basketball. Well, I just think Kareem as a, is is the GOAT of basketball, greatest of all time. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. I didn't even get into the real GOAT talk. You're, you're saying Kareem's the GOAT? What about the guy whose shoes you're wearing right now? He has good apparel. Wow. What, so you're saying Michael Jordan is not the greatest of all time? No. Kareem is. Kareem. How is Kareem over Jordan? Um, every level of basketball, Kareem won a championship on. He uh, spent all four years in college. He has about seven championships, eight championships total, multiple and in, uh, intriguing MVPs over the time span that he played in the NBA. How many dunk um, championships does he have? I don't know about that. How many finals MVPs does he have? He has about five. He has five? I think so. <sighs> what do his shoes look like? <laughs> <laughs> they, they didn't endorse um, black uh, Muslim athletes at that time. So you're saying Michael Jordan was groundbreaking? Yeah, Got definitely it. so. And um, how many commercials does Kareem have? He has a movie with Bruce Lee. Oh, he does. Yeah. Does he have one with Bugs Bunny? Well, I think the one with Bruce Lee is more classic because Bugs Bunny is a cartoon and Bruce Lee is not alive. So it was harder for Jordan to make that movie because he was acting with the green screen. <laughs> I mean, he didn't have no social premise there yet. 
<laughs> I would say that. Okay. So you're saying Michael Jordan is not the greatest of all time? I'm an extremely big I'll LeBron Michael, fan. But I'll put damn. Michael Jordan at number two. After Kareem? After Kareem. Wow. Then I'll go Bill Russell, Kobe, and then LeBron. Okay, say the order again. Kareem, Jordan, Russell, Kobe, Le- LeBron. Okay. And LeBron just made my list. I, just... I mean, that's a that's a lot coming from you. I don't I don't know anybody that hates LeBron. Hey, more you, than you. nobody can beat that starting five though. Mm, I definitely think that starting five is beatable. Mm. I mean, this is your interview, not mine, so I'm not going to give you my <laughs> starting five. But there'd be a couple of guys named Shaq and Tracy McGrady probably on there somewhere. Maybe Kevin Garnett that, or that's... Tim Duncan. I don't know. So, all right, let's get into our next topic. All right. <laughs> Are you familiar with the Ghetto Boys? Uh, what have they done? Okay, so the Ghetto Boys are a rap group from Houston, Texas. Okay. Uh, Scarface, mm-hmm. Willie D, okay. and Bushwick Bill. Okay. Bushwick Bill passed away. Rest in peace. So the Grammys just did uh, like a 50-year special of the hip-hop of the past 50th years. And um, Scarface performed My Mind Playing Tricks on Me, mm-hmm. which is a Ghetto Boy song. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the Grammys called Scarface, had him go out, sing the song. Willie D's upset. He didn't get a phone call because he's part of the group. Okay. Do you see his beef there or is he just tripping? Uh, who are you tripping with? He's tripping with Scarface. <laughs> they got a podcast and he's like, yo, you know what I mean? You robbed me. You robbed the fans. My little niece was on watching it on TV and they said, oh, Scarface there. Is Uncle Willie there? And I had to tell her I wasn't going to be on it because my so-called partner didn't even call me. He just went and did the Grammys. Like, they do a podcast every day or, like, every week. Mm-hmm. And on Thursday, he was like, all right, I'm out. I got to go. I'm going to go Hold see Hold on. A they do a podcast together. Together. So, on Thursday, when they're leaving. And then he performed a song that they group did yeah. at the Grammys. Yes. So, and so, didn't call him. So, it's exactly. To tell him. To tell him. Oh, yeah. He had a pocket. Not only did he not invite him about it, he just was like, oh, I'm going to go check out the Grammys this weekend. He didn't say he was performing. He didn't say he was nothing. <laughs> He's like, I'm just I'm thinking about checking out these Grammys. He thought he met on TV. Right. Because we go, you know what I mean? It's like me, you leave right now, you're like, oh, I think I'm gonna go check out this game. You probably think I'm gonna watch it on TV, but no, right. I'm flying over there and this and that. And don't even invite you. And we work together and we got this song together. Right. So who do you think was out of pocket for that? Scarface. Scarface. And the and the people who run what he do. But you can't really expect them to give a shit, right? They're not going to care about the culture or somebody's feelings. They, they say Scarface is a bigger well, name. Let's get Scarface. Obviously, he was being controlled by somebody in order not to pick up a phone and call your partner. You have an everyday podcast. Dude. But if you see the podcast, Scarface is just like that. Scarface is worried about Scarface, and he don't give a shit about other, anything other than Scarface. Then Willie D shouldn't be surprised. He's not. He's just upset. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, he got a right to be upset. I'll call my partner. Hey, man, you got the, you you coming down to the Grammys too? I'd have called him on accident. Yeah. You know what I mean? And told him, but you know what I mean? To each his own. One of those fake invitations. Well, come on out. Oh, shit. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you ain't going to be able to make it? Oh, man. <laughs> like right at the last yeah. minute. <laughs> <laughs> right when I'm boarding the last plane going to that motherfucker. Okay, so how, let's go to the next one. How, what do you feel about the homeless people in this city? Taking over. If you ask me, they're taking over because you're a business owner. You have property. You ever look around your complex and be like, damn, <laughs> when y'all going to start paying rent? Uh, I mean, when when I was here at Livewire, it was a big thing. It's just the smells and it's just so enclosed. And, but, you know, where I am now, it's kind of like, the more you take care of those homeless people in your area, the more you can start to see them evolve. You get to really see them, yeah. Uh, you know, increase what they're trying to do, or increase their drug habit. Cause damn, well, I be seeing them rotate every couple of weeks, and it's hard to keep. I be trying to build rapports with them, pay them to take out my trash, stuff but like you're paying that. Paying them though, it's just not working out. You paying I'm, them, you giving them cash versus walking them somewhere and getting them something they need. Yeah, so you think that's the key? That's definitely. What thing. about you? Don't think that they're taking over the city? I mean, homeless is. I mean, homeless has been around since people ain't. I mean, I think a lot of homeless people are homeless because they can't take their dogs into shelters and stuff like that. Mm. For one, I think that they want to be like that if they are just out there. And then I think that some people just have a mental health issue and it hasn't been addressed, which doesn't 
let them operate regularly in society like everybody else. You know what I mean? I think those are the three top reasons for me. And to say that homelessness is taking over, is is it I, I think more is it wealthiness taking over? No, I don't I don't really mean it from <laughs> that aspect of as in they exist. I'm talking about they're getting real ballsy with where they'll just set up shop at. You know oh, what I mean? Like my, you go Modesto, somewhere and you, you be like you ain't dealt with the homeless people in Oakland. They got whole ass beds and furniture. That's what I'm saying. Light it's, fixtures and plug ins and yes. jacuzzis and <laughs> That's what I'm saying. You I, I see even if I'm in, in the Bay Area, I'll be like, damn, you set up right here? You got a coffee maker. But that's what homelessness does to you. And you know, and that goes starts from the top. I mean, isn't wealthiness taking over? I mean, a lot of we have a lot of million and billionaires in California mm-hmm. and these so called, you know, leaders and stuff. And uh, none of that money comes out of their pockets to clean up the streets, really. I mean, it could just be one false swoop. It was, if it was up to you and you were given an unlimited, or not, not an unlimited, just a reasonable budget to address homelessness, what would you do? In California? Right here in this city, Modesto. The first thing I would do? Yeah. I mean. Given a budget. Given a budget. Yeah, you got a budget. I would probably get one of the biggest, emptiest warehouses out here. To do what? To funnel the homeless there and kind of create a, a shelter. Kind of like how they did at Beerbrook Park? Yeah, but with a, with a roof and, you know, uh, actual, being able to have actual uh, tenancy. Um, try to get the government to fund that program. So with you the, turn it into like a big dorm? Yeah. And then would they be allowed to bring their dogs? Or you'd have a pet section? I, I probably would have a pet section. All homeless people have pets. Well, I probably would have a S- pet section and maybe get with the SPCA to get those dogs neutered and stuff. That way they're not having more dogs while they're, you know, right. with their homeless owners and stuff like that. And, you know, uh, you know, you just got to build those people up and, you know, uh, you know, make them responsible and accountable. Yeah. Well, if they were responsible. Doesn't mean that they can't not become responsible with some type of organization absolutely with what you're gifting them with i'm not saying hey bring your dog we're gonna check them you you automatically check in no it should be still a criteria list because you don't want rape to happen you don't want drugs to come in you don't want all of those fleas <laughs> scabies uh what's the bed bugs you don't want any yeah. of that stuff from a to zinc you know <laughs> yeah, you don't want so. any of that stuff to come in with them what you're trying to do is uh transform them to get back out there to be responsible people on their own you think it could yeah. be done yeah it can be done all right and i think a lot of these wealthy people can uh i so, said wealthy yeah so wealthy people tap in mars mm-hmm. radio is going to help you help them yeah right. <laughs> and cam's gonna uh spearhead the whole thing right all right so um are you familiar with the artist glorilla yeah are you familiar with her show that was in the barrier recently yeah all right so what are your thoughts on her getting the 30K to perform and then not performing? People were, you know, can't be through the show. Uh-huh. Along with Bass Stars and a couple other people. That, I mean, take her to court. You think? I know, you know, with Oakland, California, violence is the first option. <laughs> <laughs> but you think that's right? Always. I mean, if, he, if, if, if the promoter paid her for a performance. Sue the fuck out of her. The sewer? Sue her for the money that you lost. Sue her for the money you invested. Sue her for the money that your fans invested in them tickets. Refund everybody money back to them once you win your lawsuit. And then never book her again in the Bay Area. But how does that happen if they went through Dame, who's from Oakland? Where do you think the line of communication was? Do you think it was just disregarded like, fuck it, we're just not going to perform? Or do you think it was maybe booked as an appearance and they were told they were getting a performance. You know what I mean? I don't have no idea how, you know, some promoters do, do business. It goes off their resume and the credibility that they come with. Yeah. You know, as far as the promoter goes, I don't know anything about them. Um, to get that type You're not of familiar art- with Combi from Oakland? No. Nah. No? To get that type of artist, you have to be some type of promoter yeah. or have an actual bag behind you or some type of yeah. you stand on something to get them to come in there and actually uh, come through there and uh, maybe walk through or 
or or even perform or whatever type of deal you had with them. But at the same time, you know, uh, sometimes you invest that money in being a promoter and things don't work out right. So you need to take the legal way and make that artist pay, you know, uh, the right way versus, you know, people are going to have high emotions. You know, like I said, Oakland, California, <laughs> she should have just, she should have just fucking performed. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like versus running out and, you heard about it? Yeah. I, I mean, there's plenty of videos up, so. Yeah. It was crazy. Got so, caught up real quick. So, are you familiar with um, Dana White? UFC. UFC president, yeah. Right. You've heard about him, right? Right. Okay. So, um, I don't know if you know, but he has to deal with everything that a UFC fighter does. They have to answer to him for it. So, he's pretty much like judge and executioner. If you... Get caught doing the DUI, you go see Dana White, he gives you your punishment. If right. you beat your wife, he's the one that's going to give you the punishment. So, <laughs> no, I mean, as far as the ramifications yeah, okay, of yeah, being able you to being fight. signed up under the UFC. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and he's real big on domestic violence. Okay. I don't know if you saw, but on New Year's, he was caught on tape smacking the shit out of his wife. When they had dinner or something? No, they were at a party in, like, Saudi Arabia or something. But okay. the video shows she smacked the shit out of him first. Right. What are your thoughts on women hitting men first and if it's a place where the man should just always walk away or is there any justification to a man ever putting his hand back on a woman after she strikes him first? It's a fine line. It's a very fine line. That's why I want your opinion line. on uh, <laughs> I think I think uh married I mean for married couples if those type of things happen it's a, you know walk away every time if you want to keep your wife type thing. But, you know, it's a lot of single women out here hitting men. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of it's a lot of baby mamas out here hitting baby daddies, and you guys don't have those type of ties. So yeah. uh, a lot of men feel like I have a couple daughters. So, I, you know, I would never want my daughter to put her hands on her dude. I think a lot of women need to walk away. So you think if a woman puts her hands on a man, that the man should still walk away? Or do you think there's any justification from him is retaliating? I mean, not he can't just get in the middle of the street with her and fight her, but do you think there's any justification for retaliation? Maybe like, maybe not like a complete punch, maybe like a slap, maybe like a. <laughs> you think there's any room for retaliation? There? I think whatever retaliation you would want to come with at that point of being hit after somebody's assaulting you, mm -hmm. I, I think that is pretty much justified. So if through, a woman hits law. a man. If a woman hits a man and she hits him and he hits her back, you as a man, don't you don't have a problem with that? It's like, you think it's even Steven. Or she asked for it. Nah, she asked for it. <laughs> <laughs> she hit hit him. But what if she hit him in a way where he felt But what if she said she uses the man's excuse and she's like, she didn't really mean it? <laughs> but it would have to be talk it would have to be talking that long enough. I don't think no man about to sit there and be like, hey man, why you hit me? Right. I mean, if it's just a reaction of you getting hit and you just, you know, but right. then when you sit there and you think about it and you like, no, I'm not letting you get away with this, right. yeah. then you've thought about it. At that point, as a man, you should have walked away. <laughs> you know, it when it's not uh off of just simple, you know, defend yourself. Have you ever seen those uh memes or those videos of women just whooping? Their dude's ass, and they're just sitting, and he's there, just taking sitting there taking it. Jeez, yeah, that's... I seen this one. There was this dude. It was a guy in front of the camera. They were on a bed, and she was behind him, and he was like singing a song that offended her. It was like you know one of them "Oh You Do Me Wrong" type songs and shit, and he was into it, and she was getting offended. Like motherfucker, you singing about me? And she just was sitting there socking him in the side of the face. Boom, boom, boom. And he's just there looking at the camera like, you see this? You see this? Like smiling, crying at the same You ain't seen that one? No, nah, man. Oh, man. I, some women. That's abuse. That is abuse. And some women are abusers, man. Mental, physical, and verbal abuse is real. You think so? <laughs> you think mental abuse is a real thing? Yeah, for sure. For example? I don't know about verbal. That, that's just like a little bit too subtle. You think verbal abuse is is like you're trying to I play, mean, people play the is victim on the phone a little bit? Call, call him like, oh, he verbally abused me. I, you know, I got some. Problems. You could have just walked away. It ain't verbal even, abuse doesn't hold you. Walking somewhere. away from words. Yeah, they'd be you like, you can walk away if you want to just you know be a mediator of the situation, right? A medium to the situation, but a lot of people ain't just walking away on no words. But if a woman put her hands on a man, shit, 
you shouldn't have did it. I agree. I agree. All right. This is our last topic, and it's probably going to be your favorite topic. Uh, you usually talk about this about once a year. Kobe? No. no. All right. Non-black people using the N-word. <laughs> I know that's a big topic of yours. Being in the barbershop with you for all oh, those years. Man. We love bringing that up every now and then and getting the whole room's opinion on it. So you're one of the strong believers that if you're not black, you shouldn't say the N-word. Is this correct? Due to the times I was raised in, correct. Right. How is your stance on that? Has, has it changed over the years or are you still? I mean, you should just don't address me like that if you're not black. <clears throat> oh, okay. So you've lo loosened up your stance a little bit. Because, I mean, it's in everything, every song, everybody's saying it. I can't mm -hmm. just be out here being mad because people using the word that I'm effectively using myself. And, you know right. what I mean? So, you know, I kind of probably done rubbed off on some people and had them use it. I mean, people, the environments of uh, where I was raised at are very diverse mm -hmm. now and in, in, in different uh, ethnicities. So... So what I'm made not, you change your stance on it? Because I remember if somebody was in the damn room and used it, you uh, you would stop, <laughs> turn off the TVs, lower the music. You know what changed? <laughs> because what? it takes hella energy to to focus in on everybody that's using that word when it's so common now. If you're not directly using it towards me, you know I still have some some friends that aren't uh, black that use that word, and uh, you know sometimes I. Let it roll off my back. Sometimes I'll say something about it. Sometimes, you know, but it's just about, you know, uh, the times that we're in now. So, so because um, you felt like you were fighting a battle by yourself, low key? Hey, yeah, it's definitely a battle fought yeah. <laughs> alone. It's not a lot of black guys out here that's like, hey, man, don't use that word with me. You know, it's right. pretty much, you know, everybody. So if all the black people that you know were down to unify and say, hey, man, we're not letting this fly no more. Let's take a stance. You'd be with that. But you just don't want to be the angry person always bringing shit up that nobody else is fighting for. Thanks. OK. Now, what about the music? Do you still listen to um, non-black people that use it in their music? Very rarely. Very rarely. OK. Uh, and it's not even about using that word. It's about just like, bro, I wasn't raised with you, bro. It's you not. It's you, not so. It's not so much as a, a term of endearment. That shit is a, was a, a a living and a lifestyle and a and a survival and a, it's just like certain tones even come with that word. Certain ways you say it. Certain ways you move with it. Like I wasn't raised with a lot of these people, so when they say it, they might be saying it as a term of endearment, but I might take it a totally different way depending on the frequency that's coming out your mouth. So, in your opinion, when you're black, also you get the pass or the you assume they get it. They understand the pain that you guys went through. But if they're not black, you're like, mm, I don't really know if they understand what they're getting away with here right now. Is that, is that what you're saying? Well, I would think that, you know, a lot of black people have a lot of things in common versus right. a Hispanic and a black person or, you know. Yeah. But you can be fooled nowadays. You know, a lot, a lot of the black, a lot of black people now are, are in different situations where their parents live hard and now their lives are easy and they haven't had to, you know, live and grow up in that type of environment to even use that word or know when to use that word. So or experience the pain that came from it. Exactly. So, you know, it's 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 a give or take. And then when you when you're out in, you know, public and people are using that word and you want to say something, but they're not talking to you. Hmm. They're just having a regular conversation that you would have if you was black. It's it's a common word now. Right. Right. So mind your business. So you just subscribe to the mind your business after all these years. Mind your business. I man. cannot let the Mars radio viewers know enough how much growth, maybe not even growth, because who's to say if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but how much change you've went through over the years. So, I mean, that's pretty significant. and. Crazy to see you change so much, but hey, I guess it happens to everybody, huh? Yeah, man, you got the, uh, you know, you got to grow up sometimes, you know. I'm you I'm uh, to a point in my life where I think I need to just pick my battles. Sounds like that's what you're saying. Basically, you got to know when to pick your battles. Some some battles are to be fought because it's still a war out here. So some sure. battles are to be fought. Some battles are to, 
you know, just let go and, uh, you know, just being a, a black person and growing up where I grew up at in the area that I grew up in and the times that I grew up in, you, I mean, you should have some tough skin by now. Right. You know, a lot of things should just rub off your back if it's not directed towards I, you. I agree with the tough skin, but I do not think that you should have to take something that offends you just because it's the norm. You should be able to speak up if that really offends you. Oh, but if it's, if it's something to where you've grown and you're like, you don't get offended, you're understanding it more because society is, I understand that as well. But if it's something that you definitely have a strong stance on, I'm with the, fuck it, if you're the only one that feels that way, still speak your mind. And I'm not like on the... If I can't beat them, join them too. Right, like right. Like if it's directed towards me, mm-hmm. or or I feel somebody's is really out of really out of pocket using it, yeah, derogatory towards somebody else, and you don't really know. Yeah, I'll definitely say something, right. you know. But you know, I mean, to just do that all the time is like you the the nigga Superman. Right. Do you feel like there's any difference in? Or that that it matters either way more or less if the if it's the A at the end or the E R or you think it's still both it's the same. Nah, thing. don't like, put that E R on there. You still can get your ass out. Oh, so the E R is worse. Yeah, the E R get the get you back into that real quick. <laughs> yeah, got it, got it. With me, I think obviously the E R is unacceptable. But with me, because sometimes I will say something. I will. <laughs> I'm not even gonna lie to you. Sometimes I will say something to a Mexican. Motherfuckers be letting you get away with that shit. To a Mexican. Okay. I'll tell a Mexican like, "Hey, bro, aren't you Mexican?" And they'll be like, "Yeah." I'll be like, "Why don't you say some Mexican shit?" I'm just saying, have a little bit of pride about yourself. I'll go at it a different way. I'll try and make them feel bad. You know what I mean? Like it's like it's like black people can make anything look good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They can. They can just. We came up with a derogatory word. We changed it to an A instead of an ER, which probably damn near has the same meaning to all white people right. in America. And we just say it and wear it a different way. I think it's and it's just like it's not it's I not agree. Black, black black people did that. They did, but I think it's more of where you went back to it, and you were saying it's. I I look at it from a poverty standpoint. When you're poor or in poverty. You work with what you got, and whatever you got, you make that shit look good. Like right. menudo, that's one of our most famous dishes of food as a Mexican, and that shit is made from the the shit nobody else wanted. You know what I mean? Cow tongue and hominy, and it's just it's a fucking soup, really. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. But it's like a delicacy nowadays. So I definitely feel like when you're broke, when you're poor, when you, you when you don't have a lot of resources, you use the resources you have, make that shit cool. You know what I mean? The same with the the gear. Food, you know, wearing your hat, your clothes, oversized, undersized, whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, but as far as the N-word, um, to me, it matters the intent. You know what I mean? Like, if you're saying E-R with bad intent, it's all bad. But if you're saying the A with bad intent, it's, it's the same as the E-R to me. You know what I mean? Yeah, if the you, word, if you're saying the word is just the same. It's just yeah. who's using it. And, you know, we base a lot of things on race. Mm-hmm. So I was raised in a racist household, I can say that. Because, you know, you got to understand my grandparents was old people and they lived in the 1920s and in <clears throat> the 1910s and they yeah. lived through that type of stuff. So, you know, you know, certain things are taught in your household. And then when you, you know, you come home and you knew school and you using that word, right. sagging your pants, you know, your grandma telling you, hey, that ain't how stuff's supposed to be. You like, no, I'll do what I want to do. So it's the same thing that these kids are doing now. You know yeah. what I mean? It's just that the whole world has that vibe. Yeah. And when you have an older generation that is influencing you, their beliefs are going to be foreign to you, but they're still going to rub off on you. Right. So the, the older person that went through that traumatization of having to deal with racism themselves, being told no darks allowed, no colored allowed, there's separate bathrooms. You can't use this faucet. The, all that matters because when they come home, they're going to air that frustration to those kids. And then they're going to grow up, like you said, you know, right. being influenced by it. Being culturally culturally diverse in my, in my youth did a lot for me because I got to see a bunch of different cultures my whole life. Yeah. But, you know, just in, 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 in our neighborhood, we only really had black people saying nigga. I, I right. just haven't got used to everybody saying it, and I probably will never be used to everybody saying it. Right. But it's just like I can mind my business too. Right. I feel you. I feel you. All right. Well, 
that pretty much wraps it up right there. My dude. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's Mars Radio, me, Mr. Picasso, and we out.